Uh, good morning, everybody. We will continue today uh, our lectures on statistical computing and machine learning. And um, so this is going to be our first lecture where formally we will start discussing about uh, Bayesian inference. So uh, I will be starting with a discussion on the sufficiency and likelihood principles and reviewing a little bit about maximum likelihood estimation again that we have seen. And then formally uh, move to uh, define uh, the prior, posterior and the predictive distribution and uh, give some examples from the Gaussian case. Uh, the general examples related to inference uh, for the multivariate Gaussian will be reviewed in uh, the follow-up lecture. So this will be a series of two lectures to cover just inference on the Gaussian distribution alone. All right, so let's see what uh, the topics will be uh, that we will cover today. So uh, before that, you uh, see a number of references uh, on this slide. Uh, they're all uh, related to uh, Bayesian inference. And um, I am not going to go through the details, but I think all of them are uh, useful resources to have access to and provide a lot of uh, uh, information uh, and details that they are relevant to this course. All right, so uh, we're going to start uh, reintroducing the problem of uh, parametric modeling that uh, we already have seen in the context of maximum likelihood estimators. Uh, we will uh, talk about uh, the sufficiency and the likelihood principles and how the maximum likelihood estimator basically satisfies both of them. Uh, we will uh, review, uh, to put things in perspective, the maximum likelihood estimator for the Gaussian that we already have seen. So this will be a fast review. And then we will uh, formally introduce uh, the basic idea of uh, Bayesian inference, uh, review Bayes' rule and uh, discuss what the prior uh, model is, what the likelihood and posterior are all about, uh, introduce point estimates in the context of the posterior distribution, and then uh, also introduce the uh, predictive posterior distribution. All right, uh, and of course, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to give some uh, examples in uh, uh, calculating uh, the mean, estimates of the mean for the univariate Gaussian case. Uh, the variance and precision will be postponed until the follow-up uh, lecture as well as the uh, multivariate uh, case. And um, as an appendix in the lecture today, I'm also providing you uh, some formulas related with uh, Gaussian linear models. So these are uh, more restrictive cases of uh, some of the metrics calculations that we have seen in an earlier lecture, but I think they deserve to have their own place in uh, the lecture notes because they are coming up uh, often in our calculations. And actually, I'm going to use them in um, uh, the inference of the mean for the univariate Gaussian case uh, in one of our examples. So the uh, goals for today's lecture uh, include to understand the sufficiency and likelihood principles, understand the fundamentals of Bayesian inference, uh, things such as the prior, the likelihood, the posterior, the predictive distribution, and of course learn how to perform uh, inference in the simple case uh, of the univariate Gaussian model, and in particular in this lecture, doing inference for the mean uh, mu of the univariate Gaussian. All right, so as we have already seen, right, the uh, key problem in uh, uh, parametric statistics uh, is to uh, infer uh, a probability distribution about some random phenomenon, and in particular, if that uh, probability distribution uh, fits in one of the models we have seen, uh, the statistical theory basically uh, derives uh, estimates for the parameters of that model. Okay, so we're mainly interested in this uh, course on uh, uh, parametric modeling. So we're going to assume that we have uh, uh, data coming uh, from um, some uh, model that has um, some probability model, has some parameters uh, theta, and basically, theta will be our main unknowns for uh, this type of parametric statistical modeling. Okay, so um, we are going to see this uh, function uh, 
uh, f of x given theta as a function of theta. Okay, so even though uh, this would be, uh, for example, uh, when we discuss about the likelihood function, it expresses the probability of the data coming from the specific model with parameters theta. Once we write it down, we look at this function as a function of the parameters theta. Okay. Uh, for fixed realizations of the observations. So effectively, if I can write this in uh, both ways, this is um, the uh, way that, for example, if you have a Gaussian model with parameters theta and you have some observation x, you can write the likelihood like that, but the way we're going to be using it uh, to do parametric modeling will be as a function of theta, so the preferable way of denoting this will be some function here indicated as a script L of theta given uh, the observations x. Right? So for fixed realizations, um, uh, little x, uh, we look at this as a function of the parameters theta. Okay. Let me uh, introduce sort of a trivial example of a parametric uh, inference uh, problem. And uh, uh, this is sort of an example from uh, many textbooks and has to do with the problem of uh, modeling uh, forest uh, fires. So we want to model the probability of uh, uh, a fire and we want to account for different uh, dependencies on things like uh, humidity, average temperature, degree of management of the forest, etc. And let's say our parametric modeling is uh, what we call a logistic uh, uh, model, and we're going to revisit those uh, uh, later in the course. Uh, so a logistic model will look like this uh, in terms of the uh, humidity, uh, average temperature, and degree of management of the forest indicated here as H, T, and X. And the main uh, parameters in the model are uh, the parameters A1, A2, A3. So a parametric modeling will be given some um, uh, data. Uh, we should uh, try to estimate these parameters A1, A2, A3, uh, so that this particular model best explains uh, these given observations. Okay, so let me introduce something that uh, uh, in some sense is uh, new to our lectures, and this has to do uh, with the sufficiency principle. And before that, I want to uh, remind you something that I believe I already have mentioned in, in passing in the earlier lectures. And this has to do with uh, what we call uh, the sufficient statistics, uh, 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 sufficient statistics for the estimation of some parameters. So let me put it first in uh, common uh, uh, English. Uh, if you have some observation sex, Right? And this can involve multiple uh, realizations of the round of variable capital X that you see here, it can be X1, X2, etc. So if we have some uh, observations X1, X2, and our objective is to compute some parameters theta, it comes out that uh, the uh, way the data affect the estimation of the parameter theta are through some function uh, T of the data. And that function is called the sufficient statistic of the data. Think of this as a combination of the data that you collected. Is the, uh, that particular combination is the one that you need to be able to estimate the parameters theta. And if you want me to uh, throw this, uh, uh, you know, uh, right away, think of estimating, for example, uh, the mean. Uh, coming, let's say, from a Gaussian, right, and, and I'm giving you data x1, x2, uh, xn, you know that to estimate uh, the mean of the Gaussian, let's say, doing maximum likelihood estimator, the only thing you need is uh, you need to compute the uh, empirical mean. So the combination of the data that you need is x1 plus x2 plus xn divided by n. So the sufficient statistic in that case is really the sum of the observations x1 to xn. So what that means is that once you collect all the data uh, and you compute their sum, when it comes to estimating the parameter theta using maximum likelihood, you can actually get rid of the data and only keep the sufficient statistic t of x. Okay, So a function t of capital X, 
is said to be sufficient if the distribution of x conditional upon t of x is independent of theta. So uh, let's try to sort of try to understand what this statement says. It says this function t of x is said to be sufficient if the distribution of x conditional on t of x is independent of theta. Okay. Remember, t of x contains all the information uh, that is needed to compute theta. So if I'm given t of x, I don't really need to know theta, which means the conditional distribution of x, uh, condition on t of x and theta, is actually the same as the conditional distribution of x given t of x. So let me, um, I'm going to start with the bottom of the slide to make this uh, a little bit more concrete. So let me take um, this. Uh, so this is my likelihood function that gives me the probability of the data given the parameters theta. So I can write it as uh, uh, the probability of x and t of x given theta by adding t of x uh, as an uh, uh, you know argument in this joint probability density. I am not really doing. Uh, I'm not adding anything new because t of x, all the information on t of x is also contained on x, right? So this is equal to that, okay? And then if you write the product rule, you can actually write this as the probability of x given t of x, uh, comma theta, uh, times the probability of t of x given theta, okay? So let me concentrate on this blue probability that is the probability of x given t of x and theta. So using this sufficient principle, effectively what I'm saying is that this probability is the same as the probability of x given t of x. Because the idea here is t of x is what I need to compute theta. It contains all the information uh, for me to provide an estimate of theta, so I don't really need theta in the conditioning because t of x has that information that defines theta, okay? So effectively we have the factorization that you see here, and I'm also showing this with a small uh, probabilistic graphical uh, model that effectively has the errors to define the dependencies between the variables. So you can see uh, if you want to write down uh, the uh, distribution of these joint variables, really you can uh, factorize it as the probability of x given t of x, which is this, uh, times the probability of t of x uh, given theta. Okay? So you notice here that the only dependencies uh, of um, uh, where the parameters come, they are through this uh, term h of t of x uh, given theta. Okay, h of t of x given theta. All right, so the sufficient statistic contains all the information that the data bring uh, regarding the parameters uh, theta. And I already gave you this example with uh, the univariate Gaussian. So if you compute the likelihood for the univariate Gaussian and you write it in terms of the parameters theta 1, which is the mean, and theta 2, which is the variance square, you get this nice exp expression that we have seen before, and immediately you can uh, conclude that the only information from the data that you need to evaluate uh, through maximization of this uh, function, the parameters theta, is really the sum of xj's and the sum of xj squares. So effectively, the uh, sufficient statistics for the univariate Gaussian, they are literally this um, uh, summation of xj's and the summation of xj squares. Now, keep in mind uh, that this sufficient statistics, they are, uh, you know, uh, they are not unique. So, for example, instead of using the sum of xj's and sum of xj squares, in uh, uh, maybe in other slides and in various textbooks, you may see the sufficient statistics being defined as the sample mean x bar, so it is the sum of xj divided by n, or through this uh, sum of squares that uh, they are not just xj squared, but xj minus the sample mean square, okay? And, um, uh, you know, so this basically they are equivalent, all right, they're sort of, uh, if you know one set of uh, sufficient statistics, the other one you can uniquely identify it. 
but I can write down my likelihood in terms of x bar and s square by rearranging the terms that I had in the previous slide. And, you know, with some trivial algebra, you can see that the likelihood now is written in terms of x bar and in terms of um, s square. Actually, uh, uh, writing the likelihood in terms of x bar and s square, it would be common uh, in um, some of the derivations and examples that we will do in this lecture, so you will see uh, more of that as, as, um, as we go along. So just remember for now that uh, the sufficient statistics, they are not uh, unique, all right? So I can use this or I can use uh, x bar and s square. They're all alternative type, uh, you know, of sufficient statistics for the same problem, for the estimation of the same parameters. Okay, so let me introduce now that we know that the sufficient uh, statistics are basically these combinations of the data that uniquely define uh, the parameters. Um, uh, let me uh, sort of uh, proceed with what is called the sufficiency principles, okay? So imagine that um, uh, you do some experiments, right? And you collect one set of observations X and another set of observations Y, and both of them, let's say, they have the same sufficient statistics, okay? Uh, uh, again, in the context of estimating these parameters uh, theta. So if the sufficient statistics of the two data sets are the same, then the inference about uh, uh, theta will actually uh, be identical and will give you the same values uh, of theta. This is the sufficient principle. So let me uh, uh, try to uh, give you uh, one example with uh, data that are drawn from this Gaussian. And I'm only concentrating on the mean, so I'm taking the variance to be equal to 1. And uh, I'm using a sufficient statistics being the sum of my observations xj. So think again that uh, you're conducting one set of experiments where you get this data xj with this sufficient uh, statistic, and then you conduct uh, another experiment where you get uh, observations xj prime, uh, and they have statistics uh, t of x prime from 1 to n, uh, okay, in such a way that uh, the sufficient statistics of the two data sets are the same. So let me uh, consider two cases now for this example. One will be to use the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean. Uh, and you remember the, uh, the maximum likelihood uh, estimate for mu is the empirical mean. So obviously my two data sets, x and x prime, will give me the same uh, MLE estimate for the mean because the sufficient statistics are the same. So from this equation, the means will come to be identical, okay? And uh, so the MLE estimate, uh, uh, and in general, the MLE estimator satisfies the sufficiency principle. Let me do another example, and let's say that somehow I have an estimator that says that for uh, the mean of the Gaussian, uh, take the first element of your data set, take x1, okay? So, obviously, you can have two uh, data sets that satisfy the sufficiency condition exactly as before. However, uh, there's no reason why x1 should be equal uh, as x1 prime, which means that your estimate uh, mu1 for the mean uh, is not going, in general, to be equal to the estimate mu2 computed from the second data set, which means that this particular uh, estimator for the mean of the Gaussian does not satisfy the sufficiency principle. Okay, um, let me introduce now another uh, principle um, that is called the likelihood uh, uh, principle. And so uh, it says basically that in the inference about parameters theta, the information brought by an observation is entirely contained in the likelihood function. Okay, in some sense, we have accepted this as a fact because this is the only thing that we have used. But, um, you know, this is formally introduces this as a principle. All the information that comes from the data regarding the parameters theta comes through this likelihood function. And remember, we treat this as a function of the parameters. Now, if we have two likelihoods, uh, that uh, are proportional to each other, and the constant of the proportionality can be even a function of the data, right? So I can have a likelihood L1 and a likelihood L2, 
then uh, both of these likelihoods bring the same information uh, about, uh, about theta in this particular case. Okay? And uh, in some sense, uh, we can immediately see that um, our maximum likelihood estimator actually uh, satisfies this condition because if you apply the maximum likelihood estimator for L1 and L2 likelihoods, right? You notice, so uh, this th this um, argmax of L1 of theta will give me my MLE estimate using L1, uh, and uh, uh, L1 is really something that is n doesn't depend on theta times this likelihood. L2 that depends on theta. So obviously uh, the argmax of L2 would be the same thing as the argmax of L1. Okay, So the MLE satisfies uh, the uh, likelihood principle. So in principle actually I can uh, say uh, that uh, maximum likelihood is uh, uh, one straightforward uh, way to implement both the sufficiency and the likelihood principles. Right. Uh, but the way that this likelihood principle is stated uh, on the top doesn't imply uh, anything. It doesn't say uh, anything about maximum likelihood estimators or anything like that. It's a very vague, very general statement that simply says all the information brought from observations for estimating the parameters theta is contained in the likelihood. Okay, But again, we have seen through examples already that the maximum likelihood estimator satisfies both the sufficiency and the likelihood principles. Okay, and um, I am summarizing actually those uh, uh, statements now with equations. Uh, the already we have seen the second statement right uh, for uh, the likelihood principle, and we see the first statement when it comes to the sufficiency principle. Uh, if uh, uh, you remember we had split it our likelihood from the sufficiency principle as some function of x times um, uh, some a function of t of x given theta. Okay, so these are the sufficient statistics given theta. This was in an earlier slide. Uh, there is no theta in g of x, so um, uh, so the uh, only place uh, where theta comes is this function h. And you see explicitly that the sufficient statistics is all the information you need from the data for the estimation of the parameter theta. And this uh, MLE estimate, the MLE estimator, so does satisfy the sufficiency principle. OK, so let me uh, review, uh, since we're going to try to extend these ideas, let me review this um, maximum likelihood um, uh, estimator for the mean and the variance uh, for the Gaussian. And because you already have seen this multiple times, I am not going to go through uh, any of the algebra. I'm going to be going rapidly through the slides, giving you the final results. So we're having a collection of data uh, that are drawn from some Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma square. And uh, if you want to estimate mu and uh, sigma square, effectively what you will need to do is uh, maximize the likelihood or the uh, log likelihood. And um, so um, if you uh, write down the log likelihood, you get your familiar expression. Uh, actually, we already have seen in an earlier slide an even better way to pose the problem as the minimization of minus the log likelihood. All, right? All of these are equivalent statements. But when you do the optimization problem, uh, and you set the derivative of this log um, likelihood to zero, you're getting the results that we already have seen before, that uh, the MLE estimates for mu and sigma square are the empirical mean uh, and empirical variance. Now, uh, I remind you, because uh, these estimates involve xi, and xi are realizations from random variables, you can actually think these estimates uh, as being random variables. So one of our interests will be to know what is the expected value of these estimates under the probability density from where the data come. And that uh, led to this concept of uh, bias. And uh, we already have seen, and I'm not going to repeat the algebra, we already have seen that the um, 
you know, the uh, MLE estimate for the mean uh, is an unbiased estimator. So, so if you take the expectation of the output with respect to your data distribution, you get the true uh, mean uh, of your distribution. But unfortunately, the MLE estimate for sigma squared, it's, it's uh, uh, biased. Uh, it uh, uh, underestimates the uh, true variance. And uh, the derivations of this were given in an earlier slide. If you forgot, you can revisit the details given in the proof um, uh, here. Um, and I think we also uh, uh, discussed that if you really want to get rid of the biased uh, uh, nature of the estimate for sigma square, one of the ways to do it is to define a new uh, estimate, which is 1 over uh, n minus 1 times this um, sum of squares that you see here, okay? And um, uh, this uh, uh, n minus one factor, you will see it in uh, lots of computer programs, in lots of textbooks, so just know that basically you modify this, the previous one over n to one over n minus one to enforce that uh, this estimate, it's unbiased. Now, lots of statisticians have an explanation for this n minus one. You remember that um, uh, the biased nature of these of these estimates comes from the fact that uh, in your MLE estimate for sigma square, you already use the MLE estimate uh, for the mean. So the statisticians will say that you have to remove one degree of freedom uh, because one of degree of freedom has already been used uh, to fit uh, the mean in uh, the MLE estimate, okay? So, uh, one way or another, um, you know, we have 1 over n minus 1, the sum of the squares, and that removes the bias. Uh, I gave you a very nice uh, summary of a schematic that comes from uh, Chris uh, Bishop's uh, PRML uh, textbook that uh, very nicely indicates the bias nature of the uh, of the uh, MLE estimate for the variance. And again, I uh, remind you this is a true Gaussian uh, and you sample in three different experiments only two data points that you see with these blue dots. And in all three cases, the variance is underestimates the true variance. You can see how wide the true variance is. And if you, even if you average the variance in the three cases, it will come out to be uh, an underestimate of the true variance. However, if you average the uh, MLE estimate uh, in uh, the three cases, you will basically get the uh, true mean uh, of uh, the Gaussian distribution from where the data come from, okay? And again, this uh, emphasizes the problem that when you estimate the MLE estimate for the variance, you estimate it with respect to the MLE uh, uh, estimate for the mean. You don't use the true mean because you don't know the true mean and that is uh, the reason why um, the uh, estimate for sigma square comes to be biased. Okay, um, we already did the uh, calculation for the MLE estimate for the multivariate ga uh, Gaussian uh, as well. Uh, so the results are exactly as uh, you expect from the univariate case. The sample mean, the sample covariance is what um, uh, comes in the calculations. And um, I remind you this XX transpose, right, is a metrics, right? This is an outer, um, this, the way that I write this, uh, uh, you know, X, X transpose gives me a metrics, okay? X transpose X will give me a, a scalar, so this is a metrics. And um, uh, the derivation, uh, we already have gone through this in details. And the only thing you will need uh, to, uh, to do this rigorously is to use some results on derivatives of certain terms with respect to matrices. And I summarized those, I believe, at the end, at the bottom of this slide. So you will need uh, results that you see on the bottom of this slide. So you need to be able to take the derivatives of the log of a determinant of a matrix with respect to the matrix. And uh, this is the result that you see here. Uh, and then um, there is uh, uh, this nice expression. If you have a trace of uh, a product of uh, two matrices A, B, and you need the derivatives with respect to A, the answer comes to be B transpose. And I remind you, 
uh, the very useful trick that we did with this term here, x transpose sigma minus 1x, the trick was this whole quantity, this Mahalanobis distance is a scalar, so we write this equal to the trace, because the trace of a scalar is the scalar, and then we use the property that the trace of AB is the same as trace of uh, BA, so that way we took this x transpose and we move it to the right, so what we have on the left is sigma minus 1 times this uh, empirical covariance matrix, and then effectively when we take derivatives, uh, we can use this formula that I have here, and at the end of the day you get the right answers that I gave you in the previous slide, you get basically that the MLE estimate for the covariance matrix it is equal to the empirical covariance uh, S. Uh, one comment, um, and I, I don't know if we discussed this um, when we first saw this calculation. When I do this derivation and I take derivatives with respect to sigma inverse actually, uh, we assume uh, uh, nothing about the symmetry properties of uh, sigma or sigma inverse. So we did the calculations and by a miracle it does come that the MLE estimate for sigma is uh, symmetric. So in some sense uh, by doing nothing we uh, take care of the symmetry constraint, all right? So we were lucky in this particular case. We did not have to augment uh, the uh, log uh, likelihood with anything, uh, any complexity term that uh, enforces symmetries uh, for the covariance, okay? All right. Um, so, um, so that's the MLE estimate, and, and I also give you the derivations of those formulas uh, for those that uh, want to revisit them. Uh, remember, these formulas don't come from any magic. Actually, if you want to take derivatives with respect to the metrics, one of the easy ways to think about this is taking derivatives with respect to each component of the matrix and then arranging all of these components in a matrix form to get B transpose. Remember, trace of AB is a scalar, so when you take derivatives with respect to a matrix, you do get a matrix, okay? And uh, so you can prove this by taking, uh, doing differentiation uh, component-wise. And I give you a few other of the expressions that I had on the previous slide. Uh, and uh, so you can actually uh, revisit and uh, work on this uh, as little exercises. All right. We are ready to start uh, moving and uh, talking about uh, uh, Bayesian inference. So let me um, uh, first say a few words about uh, prior knowledge and uh, why it is uh, essential to actually being able to do a proper uh, inference, right? So let me take this particular data set. These are these red uh, dots. I am giving them to you and I'm asking you, uh, not to fit perfectly some polynomial, or in this case, a straight line through this data, but somehow uh, to do a fitting that uh, will allow you with confidence for any new x to tell me what the y is. So you see in machine learning, we're really not interested to do interpolation of the data. So I'm not going to take a high order polynomial and pass it through all this data. That's a trivial task. I'm not going to do that because these data points have noise on them. So if you perfectly fit them, you fit the noise, and we will see this discussion later on on regression models. So you're not going to be doing a good job when it comes to predictions, okay? So uh, now to be able for an arbitrary x to say what the value of y is with some confidence, uh, you will need either to have a lot of data or to have some prior knowledge, because you look, for example, in this regime here, I have no data. So uh, you need to say something about what are the type of functions that you anticipate uh, to have uh, in, um, uh, you know, in fitting this data. And you remember in, um, in an earlier lecture we talked about a smoothness prior, right? That was sort of a prior over functions. Uh, and similarly here, literally, we have uh, to put some prior model on the functions that we anticipate to fit this uh, uh, training data that you see in this picture. So uh, the idea here is uh, we need to make proper inference, we need to integrate data and priors. Now this is in 
and in particular uh, essential if the data that you have are very few. Now, if you have billions of data, right, uh, maybe this concept of a, a prior knowledge is not that essential, but if you have very limited data, you really need to integrate data and prior models, otherwise you're not going to be able to do uh, any reasonable predictions uh, in most of the cases. Okay, so uh, in uh, Bayesian statistics, uh, we're going to assume that we have a parametric model exactly as before, so this is our likelihood with some parameters theta, but now we're going to take these parameters theta to be random variables. Uh, so before you remember, we computed the maximum likelihood estimator and we computed uh, uh, a point estimate, right? A, a deterministic value of the parameters theta. And in the particular case of MLE, the, those parameters were maximizing uh, the likelihood. Now we're going to take these parameters theta to be uh, random variables, all right? And uh, we're going to put some prior model that I denote here as pi of theta on the parameters theta, okay? Uh, now, uh, you may ask, you know, uh, all right, so we're going to make this random variable, I mean, these parameters theta random variables, and we're going to put a prior on them. But let's say the problem of interest is to estimate the speed of light. So somebody will say, what does it mean to put a prior model of the on the speed of light, right? So you can think on this in multiple ways, right? You can think on uh, either doing some measurements uh, of uh, the speed of light, so somehow uh, you may need to uh, reflect the uncertainty that you have in these measurements, or you may think that you have some uh, computational model that is trying to estimate from other values, from other maybe measurements, what the speed of light is, and that model that you have is not a perfect representation of the truth of the world, is some approximation. So that so you need through that model to express your uncertainty in the parameters theta because the model is not quite right. So one way or another, you need to have a prior, and um, you know as you will uh, it will become clear this prior is very subjective. So if two individuals have to put a prior in parameters for the same model, it makes a lot of sense uh, uh, for them to maybe use different priors because uh, they are going to use their own understanding of the problem to put uh, what we call a subjective prior in, in uh, this pi of theta, okay? So, um, so we're going to, you know, uh, we're going to have to put some prior on the parameters and now the parameters are going to become uh, uh, random variables rather than being deterministic the way that we have seen uh, in uh, the earlier lectures. So before I formally uh, give you um, this uh, idea of um, uh, prior uh, uh, likelihood posterior and predictive distributions that they are in the heart of uh, Bayesian statistics, I want to remind you the application of Bayes rule in, in uh, the medical diagnosis example that we saw uh, in the very early on uh, lectures of the course. And uh, I am not going to repeat this uh, um, you know, uh, this discussion, but I want to remind you, uh, you know, we were trying to compute the probability that someone is going to have uh, tuberculosis if he takes a medical exam uh, to diagnose tuberculosis and the exam comes positive, okay? So we wanted to know what's the probability that actually that individual uh, will have uh, tuberculosis if the test comes uh, to be positive. Um, to, to be positive. So in this particular case uh, of, um, you know, uh, you know, of this medical diagnosis, right, um, you know, uh, we need sort of to try to generalize uh, the concepts. And so the first um, uh, question is, what exactly we want to do is we want to evaluate if someone has the disease or not. So there is a hypothesis there and, and uh, we need to basically evaluate if that hypothesis is true or not. So in this particular case, we didn't have a parameters for any particular model, but we had a hypothesis. Uh, and in the context of the discussions, at least today, uh, you can um, substitute parameters theta for hypothesis H. They will have exactly the same meaning uh, when it comes to the formulas that I provide 
uh, for doing Bayesian inference. Okay, but in this particular case, we did not have any parameters. We had the hypothesis that we needed to evaluate. Okay, and um, we had um, uh, a prior imposed on uh, on uh, this hypothesis, which was uh, how many people in a population actually have the disease. Uh, of course, we had data, and in the particular case, uh, the data was that the individual took a medical exam and, and the results of the exam came positive. And then we were trying to do inference, which is compute the, what I call the posterior of the hypothesis age that the person has the disease if uh, the test came, um, test came positive. Okay, so... Um, I am not going to repeat the Bayes formula. We are going to try to generalize it now. So let me uh, do so. So in our case, we had data X, and data X is the test is uh, positive. We had a hypothesis H, uh, which is does the individual have the disease uh, uh, or, or not? Um, we introduce uh, a prior model, all right? And uh, in the case of the medical diagnosis, this prior model was based in the percentage of the population that has the disease. And then uh, using, um, um, you know, we did not explicitly have a mathematical model uh, in the medical diagnosis uh, uh, case, right? Uh, I had given you explicitly different probabilities, but in general, we're going to have a likelihood model that given the hypothesis, all right, it tells me what is the probability of the day of the observations. Okay, how likely is to observe data X given the hypothesis? And in the medical diagnosis case, you can think uh, if somebody has the disease, how likely is that the test is going to be to be positive? Right, everybody sees that. So in the medical diagnosis cases, if somebody has the disease, so if H is true, uh, what's the probability actually that the test will come positive? All right, X is my observation, and the observation here means the test is positive or the test is negative. So we have the data, we have the hypothesis, the prior, the likelihood, and of course, now we can formally introduce the posterior, which is the probability of um, the hypothesis H being true after we have these observations uh, X. Now, Again, we call this prior and this posterior because prior is something we introduce before we see any data, and the posterior is something that comes out after we do some observations. So effectively, the posterior is an improvement on the prior once we actually have these observations uh, and uh, we utilize the likelihood model. So if I put all of this together, uh, Bayes rule, takes uh, the equation that you see on the bottom. Uh, the posterior is the likelihood uh, times uh, the prior uh, divided by some normalizing factor. And the normalizing factor is basically an integral of the numerator here with respect to all possible hypotheses. All right? And this is actually how we computed uh, M of X in uh, uh, the medical diagnosis uh, case. Um, so. Um, what can I say? Uh, first, you know, don't be annoyed that I'm using different symbols for the um, uh, different probabilities here. You notice uh, the prior and the posterior, because they are probabilities, I am actually denote them with uh, pi. Uh, as for the likelihood, because the function of H uh, and also for the normalizing factor M of X, I am using uh, different letters from uh, pi. Uh, but, you know, if you go and use probabilities everywhere, nobody is uh, going to say anything, but I think it is better to be consistent and have your priors and your posteriors only having uh, a pi or a p and denote uh, the likelihood and the normalizing factor uh, with uh, some function symbols. So, uh, the prior model, the uh, parameters, I already mentioned, uh, this is very subjective. Uh, and lots of uh, people in the early days of Bayesian inference, uh, they were against this whole uh, philosophy of being Bayesian, saying, well, that the results are uh, too much uh, influenced by uh, the prior. Uh, 
Well, you know, that may be uh, true to some extent if you don't have a lot of data, but keep in mind the whole formalism of Bayesian inference is actually uh, an honest uh, formalism. And uh, we will uh, see examples where even when the prior is completely uninformative, somehow uh, we are able to get uh, results that they would not be possible just by uh, using, let's say, a maximum likelihood estimator alone. Okay, so we will get something that's a little bit better even than MLE, even when pi of theta is uninformative. Okay, so uh, the likelihood model, that's your mathematical model, tells you uh, if you know the parameters or if you know the hypothesis, uh, what is the probability of observing X. So think uh, for this course that this is your mathematical model, right? If you have a solver of uh, some finite element equations, if you know the parameters to the model, you can compute the response of that solver and compute, let's say, the pressure or the velocity or the stresses in your model. So that's the mathematical model uh, given the parameters theta. And for many settings, uh, this is the area where most of the computational cost is going to be coming in computing the posterior of the parameters theta. All right. So you're going to have to compute this model for different values of theta, which means you're going to have to run your computer code multiple times. And so that will be an expensive uh, uh, type of calculation. Um, but, you know, Right now, we're going to work with toy problems and not going to bother. But keep in mind, there is a lot of research going on in generating surrogate models where somehow you don't have to run repeatedly your computer code, but do something that's a little bit cheaper than that. OK, um, so the posterior combines all of the above. OK, and uh, uh, that's our formula again uh, with the normalizing uh, factor M of X. OK. The uh, something that I, I want to emphasize uh, early on, um, and hopefully I don't confuse you, right? So our models have parameters, or there is a hypothesis that we want to test, right? And we produce the posterior of the hypothesis as we discuss for the medical diagnosis uh, case. However, I want you to uh, understand that the most important uh, applications, we don't really care about the parameters theta themselves. So this calculation that you see here with this posterior, it's sort of an intermediate step in something more important, and that something more important is to actually do predictions, um, you know, uh, with, with our model. So we will uh, see this with the so-called predicted distribution that's going to come in a few slides from now. So the posterior of the parameters is an intermediate step, but it's not the end of the Bayesian analysis. Okay? After all, if your model has a 500 parameters or a million parameters, why should you care uh, about uh, you know, this posterior? I mean, this is an intermediate calculation that is going to help you to make predictions. So if theta are the parameters in a neural network that has a million, let's say, weights, uh, and this is the posterior of those weights, that is not really something that uh, you are practically interested, right? It's a, but it's a calculation that would be useful to be able to do predictions, as we will see in a few slides from now. Okay, with that uh, said, uh, if you have the posterior, you can actually compute point estimates of that posterior, similar to uh, what we did with the maximum likelihood. And the uh, early estimate is what's called the MAP estimate. This is the maximum a posteriori estimate. And that's the parameter theta that maximizes the posterior, or even better, the log posterior. And you notice uh, nicely here, uh, this is the log likelihood. That's if you maximize on the first term, you get the MLE estimate. But now by adding log of pi, all right, you are maximizing the log likelihood. M has no parameters on it, so we don't bother. And this estimate theta star is called the MAP estimate. In many ways, you can notice here that the uh, prior probability, what it does is it regularizes the log likelihood. So there is uh, an enhanced log likelihood to account for this prior model, and that is essential to solve 
uh, many of the difficulties of uh, MLE estimators based only on the log of f. Another estimate, uh, and it is in some ways underemphasized, is the posterior mean, which is the mean of the posterior distribution. I'm using the definition of the posterior uh, mean here. Uh, in uh, many occasions, we will see that the posterior mean is a way better estimate of the parameters than the uh, map estimate. Okay, uh, People may not be calculating always the posterior mean because doing this integral may be a more difficult problem than computing the solution to this maximization problem on the top. Obviously, also, you can uh, compute posterior quantiles. So if you ask, what's the probability that theta is greater than some value a, you just perform this integral, uh, integrating your posterior from a to uh, infinity, and that will give you uh, posterior quantiles. And you can define uh, multiple of those. OK, let me uh, uh, give you now the formula for the predictive distribution. So what's the idea? Suppose that um, uh, you already have observed data x, and I, you know, this is not just one point, it can be a vector x, right? So uh, x1, x2, etc. This is why I denote this with uh, bold x. And I'm asking you, what is the probability actually that uh, I may see, uh, uh, you know, I may predict uh, some data x hat that I have not seen before, right? What's the probability actually of observing in the future data x hat, considering that up to now I have observed data x? So this is, um, is going to come as, a, as a, a probability model. I denote this uh, with another letter g of x hat given x. And uh, the only thing notice is there is no theta here. So the parameters have disappeared. And actually, if I uh, can be technical here, the parameters have been integrated out. How is that possible? Well, simple calculation. And uh, to follow me on this calculation, um, please uh, take every symbol to denote uh, probability. So when you see g or pi you know, or phi, all of these think of this as probability. So we can use the product rule of probability. So what I am doing is to compute this probability here. I am um, uh, taking the conditional uh, joint probability of x hat and theta and integrate theta out. This is the sum rule of probability. Okay. Um, all right. And um, now what I'm going to do is I I am going to um, you know um, I'm going to do the following thing. Okay. I am going to use the product rule of probability. Okay, so I'm going to write this conditional as the joint of x theta and x hat divided by the probability of the data x. And again, I'm integrating over the parameters. So I'm averaging, in essence, for all possible values of the parameters. I divide and multiply by the probability of theta and x. And then I can immediately see uh, this first ratio becomes actually the conditional probability of x hat given theta and x. And this second ratio becomes the uh, probability of theta given x, which is my posterior that obviously I have already computed based on my previous uh, discussion. Now I am going to do one final step to be able to go from here to the blue curve on the blue equation on the right. And that major step is that the conditional distribution of x hat given theta and x is equal actually to the conditional distribution of x hat given theta. In other ways, if I know the parameters theta, they uniquely define the probability of observing any data set. I don't need to know x, right? So uh, if I know theta, I don't need to know x to uh, say what is the probability of observing data set x hat. That's my likelihood model, right? My likelihood model depends only on the parameters theta. So this is equal to that, and we're done. So it says that the probability given data x to observe data x hat is this integral of the likelihood of the observations x hat times the posterior of theta given my observation sex, and then averaging uh, in the parameters theta. In principle, 
if you concentrate on the first part of this formula, right? If you were to use a point estimate, you say, if I knew the parameters theta, I know what the probability of observation x hat is. Now I don't know theta, because theta comes from some posterior distribution. So what I'm going to say is, look, not a single parameter theta is going to be able to give me this data x hat, but is all parameters theta will contribute something. So if I average over all possible values of the parameters theta coming from this posterior, I am going to be able to get this predictive distribution of x hat given uh, uh, x. Okay. So that's the predictive distribution. And um, uh, uh, let me just say clearly, you can only claim in your work that you're doing Bayesian inference and Bayesian statistics that you're fully Bayesian only if you do this type of calculation. If you sort of don't um, uh, integrate this in the parameter space using your posterior of theta, effectively, um, you know, uh, using, let's say, point estimates for the parameters theta to estimate this integral, and we will see those later on, then you're not fully Bayesian, okay? Uh, another comment that I want to make, uh, try to compare this predictive distribution with the normalizing factor that we saw in the Bayes rule. They look the same, but actually, if you pay close attention, yes, the likelihood looks to be the same, right? So this, again, the normalizing factor actually for my... Uh, X hat observations, right? This is what I'm referring here. Before we had, of course, the normalizing factor for X. But you notice, if I use that formula for X hat, here in the normalization, I had pi of theta, the prior. Here I have the posterior of, uh, of theta given the observations X. So big difference on the, um, they look the same. They're very different. This is the predictive distribution. And this is actually uh, the marginal uh, of the data uh, x hat. These marginals are going to have to play a significant role uh, in Bayesian analysis, in particular for model selection uh, and model comparison, so we're going to postpone that discussion for later on, but uh, keep in mind they're extremely important. So you may see many places where I omit them for now because they don't depend on the parameters, but they will turn out to be very significant uh, as we move uh, in this course. All right, so let me start doing some examples. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, take a Gaussian example where um, I have uh, a Gaussian that gives me some observation x1, and I take my only parameter to be uh, this uh, mean of this Gaussian. And I'm going to take that this mean follows a prior that has... Uh, uh, which is a Gaussian with mean mu zero and variance sigma zero square. Okay, so what we're going to try is we're going to try to use uh, Bayes rule to produce the posterior of theta, and that requires to multiply the likelihood with the prior. All right, and uh, this is what I have done here. And now what I will need to do is I will need to put this in the proper form of a posterior distribution for theta, and you notice. Uh, when you look inside that exponential, you have a theta squared and uh, linear terms in theta. So your head has to go directly to closing the square type of calculation that I cannot repeat uh, in every slide because it's going to come all over the place. So you can see the quadratic term, you can see the linear term, so immediately you can figure out what the variance of the um, posterior is going to be, in, and also you can figure out what the mean is going to be through the second term. And I'm going to give you the answers, and the answers are uh, what you see at the uh, bottom of this slide. Okay? So the posterior for the mean, uh, after you observe one data point x1, is given by this Gaussian. And you notice uh, the precision effectively is the prior precision. Uh, plus uh, the precision of your data distribution. And, um, and you have this nice equation uh, for the uh, posterior mean. And you can see actually it is a weighted average of your prior uh, mean and your data point x1, which in essence is your MLE estimate because you only have one data point. Okay? Now, um, somebody will say, well, um, Okay, uh, you compute the posterior, uh, 
using one data point only, that's good, can you actually uh, produce the predicted distribution? So considering that you already have observed X1, what's the probability now that you will observe uh, a data point X? All right, so this is the predictive uh, posterior distribution. And I remind you, the calculation requires that we integrate the parameters by multiplying the likelihood times the posterior. So that's my likelihood, right? Um, the normalization factors uh, are not, uh, don't bother. That's why you see the sign of proportionality. This is the posterior that we computed before. And now you get this integral and you have to integrate theta out. And again, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, what somebody can do is you can actually close the square on theta, all right? Somehow, if you combine all the terms on theta uh, in the form of a Gaussian, when you integrate theta out, that Gaussian is going to give you its normalization factor, and whatever is left is going to be um, a Gaussian in uh, X, okay? But actually, um, in uh, the slides, I believe I have a slightly different type of um, uh, you know, derivation. So actually, what uh, I am doing is I am taking this expression in the exponential and I'm rewriting it um, um, in this uh, very nice form that you see here uh, on the bottom. Okay, And this form is very nice because now you can see uh, that really what I have here is I have a bivariate Gaussian uh, distribution in X and theta with means um, uh, mu1 and mu1 and uh, uh, a variance matrix that is given by uh, what you see on this uh, slide. So really, integrating theta out is actually writing down the marginal of x. And when you have um, uh, this, um, this uh, probability, this Gaussian on x and theta, you can actually write the marginal uh, immediately. And I have given you the formulas. Uh, if you remember uh, one or two lectures ago, uh, the uh, marginal for x is going to have a mean that is uh, the mean mu1 and is going to have a variance that is the variance sigma1 squared plus sigma squared. Okay? So if you partition your vector, the first component of the mean will give you uh, the mean for this predictive distribution and the first component of the covariance matrix is going to give you the variance for this predictive distribution. So summary. Um, the predictive distribution by a miracle of nature turns out to be a Gaussian that has uh, a mean mu1 uh, that uh, is the posterior mean okay and it has a variance that is sigma1 plus sigma squared sigma1 uh, squared is the posterior variance and sigma squared is the variance in uh, your data distribution Okay, and, and all of this example using only one data point. So now you can generalize this if you have all of these things coming uh, from this Gaussian where uh, mu is a random variable following this prior and we collect n data points. Uh, the only thing you have to do differently is uh, uh, write down your likelihood and uh, write it nicely in terms of your sufficient statistics. Okay, and um, so this is you know, I push this product inside the exponential with a summation. And um, uh, if you expand this uh, square, right, and you multiply this likelihood with your prior model, this is what I have here. Uh, what you will need to do is you will need to close the square on uh, uh, mu. OK, you can see it's a quadratic term in mu. So if you close the square in mu, you will produce something that is of this form. So immediately you know it's a Gaussian that has a mean mu n, all right, and uh, has a variance sigma n squared. So actually when you expand, uh, immediately this thing will uh, uh, give you the, um, the variance. And this uh, part that multiplies linearly mu is going to, together with the variance uh, is going to help you to compute uh, the mean uh, of the posterior uh, of, uh, of mu. So let me give you the answers. The answers are given on the bottom slide. All right. So we can see that the precision of the posterior of mu is the precision of the prior plus uh, n times the precision 
of, um, of um, uh, your data distribution. So there is uh, one precision from your data distribution for every data point. I have n data points, this is what I get. And the uh, posterior mean, uh, if you rewrite it, uh, it turns out to be a weighted average uh, of the MLE estimate of, uh, uh, of mu and the prior mean uh, of, of, uh, of mu. And uh, these um, uh, weights, as you can see, are defined by the prior variance and the variance of your data set. And of course, there is an end there that will allow you to make some conclusions as to what happens uh, when you have a lot of data. Uh, okay, so let's um, visit this type of um, asymptotic, um, uh, asymptotic type of uh, uh, calculations. So uh, this is how um, you know the previous results look like for the uh, uh, both the precision and the variance of the posterior. This is the posterior mean. So if you take, um, uh, you know, we're going to take two different cases, all right? One will be, uh, let's take the case n goes to zero. So effectively, I have, um, uh, you know, I have uh, no data at all. So you can see that the posterior variance, you have no data at all. Sigma square and sigma square will cancel out. And I get that my posterior variance is the prior variance, all right? If I have no data, I can only guess that this term will go to zero, right? Uh, and if I have no data, this is zero, and I get that the mean is the prior mean. Now, if n goes to infinity, right? So this term will dominate. So this thing will cancel, all right? This will cancel. And I'm going to get, actually, this term will go to zero. I'm going to get that the, um, the uh, mean of my posterior is the MLE estimate. So if I have a lot of data, I'm actually recovering the MLE estimate uh, for uh, as the posterior mean. And if you have uh, a lot of data, if n goes to uh, infinity, um, you know uh, this becomes very small. So n goes to infinity. Uh, so you're going to get a variance that asymptotically goes to zero as sigma square over n. Okay. Uh, so if n is very large that variance is really uh, going to zero. And effectively, you get uh, the deterministic MLE estimate. Uh, so your, your posterior for the, the mean becomes a delta function centered around the MLE estimate. Okay. And by the way, because this is Gaussian, uh, the same things we said about the, uh, the posterior uh, uh, you know, mean is also uh, true for the posterior, uh, for the mode of the posterior distribution as well. If you take um, a prior that is very broad, so in some sense, this is what I will call an uninformative prior. So if the prior is uh, uh, very broad, it basically provides no information. So if sigma zero goes to infinity, this term here um, uh, dominates. So this will go to zero. Uh, these two terms dominate, they will cancel out. And effectively, what you will get in that case, you will get that the posterior mean goes to the MLE estimate and that the variance becomes sigma square over n um, uh, asymptotically. Okay, um, so um, let's see if we can uh, visit a few examples. So here is um, um, a Gaussian. So my data come from this Gaussian with this mean and uh, this variance. Uh, I'm collecting a different number of data sets, uh, one point, two points, and ten points, and, and I have a prior that has um, zero mean and a variance of 0.1, and I'm plotting them. And as you can see, as I get more and more data, the, um, the posterior becomes uh, sharper and sharper, and eventually when n goes to a very large number, it becomes a delta function, as we said, that is centered around um, uh, the MLE estimate. Okay. Now you can um, uh, revisit all these formulas that uh, we have seen up to now for the posterior mean of the Gaussian, and actually you can write these formulas um, uh, sequentially, one estimate at, at a time. Okay. And so what I mean uh, sequentially, if you have produced a posterior uh, for uh, your uh, mean, okay. Um, uh, effectively, 
uh, if you collect another data point, that posterior can now become the prior for your next uh, estimation problem where you collect one extra data point, and the calculations can be written uh, in a rather straightforward matter. matter. So the new um, uh, uh, precision is the previous precision plus, because you observe only one data point, the precision of your uh, data distribution, and similarly, the um, uh, new mean of your posterior is a weighted uh, average of your previous posterior mean and your new observation point xn. Okay, and again, the calculation of this is uh, trivial. Uh, only think that uh, your posterior that you had before it now becomes the new prior, and actually you can use the results that uh, I had given you before and also listed on the bottom. You remember I had given you the results for the posterior of mu if you observe only one data point. So if that one data point is the point xn, and if your prior uh, has mu zero and sigma zero equal to the posterior at the end step, then you can use these results here to write down these formulas that you see uh, in the middle of the slide. There is uh, an alternative uh, formulation of this that looks way more complicated, but I wanted to introduce because, in essence, uh, it makes use of uh, formulas for linear Gaussian systems. Um, and uh, that's something that I put an appendix at the end of this uh, lecture for you guys to uh, review. So let me uh, change a little bit the notation. And um, uh, I have a collection of data that here I denote as y. Uh, and, and the reason is to make this to fit uh, notation-wise with the formulas that I'm going to use. And I'm assuming that this data y come from a Gaussian that has a mean x, which is unknown. A reason, there is a reason, again, for putting x here to make this to look like the formulas I'm going to show you. And uh, there is a precision, uh, lambda y, uh, for my data distribution. And there is a prior for the mean x that has mu zero and lambda zero as its precision, okay? So these formulas for Gaussian models say the following, okay? Let me just give you the formulas first. It says that somehow, if you have uh, uh, a P of X that looks like this, and you have a conditional of Y given X that has a mean that is a linear uh, in X, so A is a matrix here, all right? So the mean here of the condition Y given X is linear, then uh, you can use Bayes' rule and invert this to write the conditional of x given y, and the answer looks like this nice expression that you see here. The proof of this using earlier derived results for Gaussians are given in the appendix that uh, I strongly encourage you to read. They are sort of uh, uh, easy to follow, but these are the formulas that we need, right? If we given p of x and p of y given x, I can invert and write p of x given y, all right? So you can think if this is the prior, this is like a likelihood, this becomes now the posterior, and in our problem x is the mean, and what is y? y is the vector of my observations, and I can write the probability of y given x uh, as a Gaussian with a mean that is linear in x, where I'm going to take this metric say to be a, a column vector of ones, uh, I'm going to take b equal to zero, and I'm going to take uh, this precision matrix for uh, the likelihood to be a diagonal matrix with uh, elements lambda y. So if you put your likelihood in uh, this form, and uh, you use the results for um, uh, x uh, from your prior that you see on the top right, uh, immediately you can actually uh, write down what the posterior of x given y is without having to close the square or do anything. And you don't have to close the square or do any of the previous algebra because all that algebra has been taken care for you inside these yellow formulas, right? To derive this, obviously, I had to do a lot of closing of squares to be able to do that, okay? So this is my formula, and if you um, actually simplify, you get the same identical results as the uh, results that um, uh, you know we derive earlier, um, uh, you know, in a sort of now uh, we get things the complicated way. But as you get more mature with this type of calculations, you can immediately utilize what is known to you, so you can write answers like that without having to uh, 
um, to do all of this algebra from scratch every time. Okay, I mean, the idea of all of these formulas are uh, when you have to use them, you use them exactly as they are without uh, having to derive things uh, uh, every time. Okay, um, the, uh, again, uh, these are uh, some results. Um, uh, this particular case comes again from uh, Murphy's Law. From some, uh, uh, the prior, again, um, uh, is uh, more narrow in the case um, in, uh, in the left. Uh, more wide in the case has a higher uh, variance in the case on um, uh, on the right, and you can see if you only have one observation. In this case, the observation is y equal uh, to three. So in um, um, you know in this particular case, uh, because I only have one observation and the prior is very strong, you can see that the posterior shifts towards the prior a little bit. Okay. In this particular case, on the right, because the posterior, I mean, the prior is very broad, the posterior actually, even with one data point, stays very close to the likelihood. Okay, so you can see now, uh, for this particular case, how the uh, prior, a broad prior, uh, or a very wide prior, can affect your results, especially when you have very limited data, and in this case, we only have um, uh, one data point. All right, so um, let me uh, uh, try to uh, finish up but uh, by taking uh, the same problem of estimating the posterior for the mean um, given by the formulas that you see on the top when the prior uh, was uh, also a Gaussian model. And uh, I am going to rewrite this um, equation for the case that I only observe one data point y. Okay, so you can literally think of this um, uh, as uh, uh, an estimation of the posterior one point uh, at a time. So, if you only have one point, right? So the uh, the MLE estimate is your observation y, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this formula that you see on the top for the mean uh, for one point, and I'm going to rewrite it like that. Uh, this formula, you know, looks different, but it's actually the same, right? If you look at the terms that multiply, so the MLE estimate will become your measurement Y because you only have one point Y. And uh, what I see here, I have sigma zero square plus sigma square minus sigma square. So I have sigma zero square divided by sigma square plus sigma zero square plus sigma square, which is this for n equal to one. And similarly, I have mu zero times sigma square over divided by sigma zero square plus sigma square. Now, why have I written uh, this uh, formula like that? Because I wanted to start introducing uh, from this lecture um, this idea uh, that is called shrinkage, right? And uh, notice here, that the data y is adjusted towards the mean mu zero, uh, and this is what we call shrinkage. Okay, so uh, the uh, this uh, posterior mean is basically uh, my MLE estimate or my data uh, point y. All right, and then uh, the data point has to be adjusted a little bit towards the prior mean uh, mu zero. So this is the idea of uh, shrinkage that you get in uh, point estimates, right? And this is, again, the posterior mean uh, when you do Bayesian, uh, Bayesian inference. And we will see it very fundamental uh, in uh, numerical cases, especially actually when we work with a multivariate Gaussian. In some sense, uh, this uh, shrinkage is also related uh, to uh, the signal-to-noise ratio that you get uh, in signal processing, where, for example, if you have uh, a noisy signal uh, and uh, that is basically Gaussian noise polluted uh, through observation that follows this Gaussian distribution, all right? So you can write the signal-to-noise ratio in this case as the expectation of the true signal, which is the variance plus the mean square, divided by... Uh, the second, um, uh, or the, you know, divided by the variance uh, of um, uh, of the noise, which is sigma square. Okay, so in uh, principle, 
this concept of the shrinkage that we see with uh, the uh, data shrinking towards the prior mean is similar to this idea of signal to noise ratio that you see uh, in different contexts. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, so we will actually uh, utilize this idea of shrinkage to create uh, empirical algorithms uh, to improve um, uh, posterior point estimates. And as I said, I do recollect there is a very nice example for uh, computing um, the mean of a multivariate Gaussian where we're going to make uh, use of this. And also, I think it's going to work nicely for the uh, posterior uh, variance in the multivariate Gaussian case. Okay. All right. Um, I mentioned that there is a nice appendix on uh, Gaussian linear models. So, um, uh, the summary is, if you're given P of X being this Gaussian model and P of Y given X is a linear function, has a mean that's a linear function on X, you can actually uh, uh, not only compute the posterior P of X given Y, if you want to interpret it like that, but also you can compute the marginal P of Y. And the results uh, are going to be extremely useful throughout this course. So you need to actually visit the slides and look at these formulas, okay? I'm not going to do the derivations, but the way that the derivation works is if you are given X and the probability of Y given X, effectively you are given the joint distribution of X and Y. And uh, here is uh, the joint distribution of X and Y. And somehow uh, if you uh, manipulate uh, the joint distribution of X and Y, uh, you can um, uh, uh, take y constant and uh, somehow see how the probability of x given y looks like, uh, or you can integrate x out and uh, compute uh, what the marginal of y is. So all of these calculations are given in the slides. They are using uh, previously derived results, uh, uh, so there is no magic to any of that. And uh, uh, if there is a summary slide that has these formulas, I am going to uh, give you that summary slide. So for example, you can see P of Y. We did not use this in um, our inference example, but you see P of Y comes from this wonderful Gaussian uh, form, okay, with a covariance that uh, you see here, uh, and uh, a mean that is A mu plus B, okay, um, where, uh, mu, uh, I believe, uh, was the uh, prior, it was uh, the mean in um, uh, P of X. Okay, so let me just go back slide, all right, so you can see uh, mu was the mean in uh, uh, P of X. All right, um, so um, please do look at this appendix. It was added to the slides for a reason. Uh, it is applicable to linear Gaussian models. And linear means that the probability of y given x has a mean that's a linear function of x. Uh, so in that case, all the formulas we learned in earlier lectures become a little bit simpler because of that linearity. And these formulas are widely used in many uh, uh, places in uh, our lectures. So I want you to uh, visit uh, this appendix and have the slides uh, ready to go uh, in your calculations. All right, so that's the end uh, of the lecture, and uh, we will uh, continue uh, with a little bit uh, heavier type of calculations in the next lecture, where we will compute first the posterior for sigma squared and the precision for the univariate Gaussian, and then we will do the even more complex case of computing the mean and the variance uh, and or precision for uh, the multivariate Gaussian, and also we will discuss a little bit uh, about the uninformative um, um, you know, limits of the various priors that we're going to be using for sigma square, for lambda, both for the univariate and the multivariate case. Uh, until then, um, have a good day. Bye.